Hello, simpletons. You're listening to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. I'm here with my good friend and co-host, TK Coleman. Let's create a great day. Alabama's here. Hi, everybody. We've got the rest of our team in the studio, but we need to pause for a second. We have two outstanding gentlemen Mm -hmm. here today on the podcast. Our, his fourth time on the show, our returning champion. He's a triple board certified physician. He is the founder of Farmer's Footprint. Dr. Zach Bush is here. <laughs> so yeah. glad to be with all of you. Uh, Dr. Bush, your last episode, I think it was our most popular episode of this year. We talked about the gut microbiome and then we quickly pivoted into talking about extraterrestrials. We'll put a link to that episode (laughs) in the show notes if folks want to check that out. But today we're here on the occasion of this new book. It is called Ordinary Soil. And the author of that book is Alex Woodard. Alex is joining us today. He's an author and a singer-songwriter. We're going to have an outstanding conversation directed by your questions. So if you have a question or a comment for the show, give us a call, 406-219-7839, or email a voice recording to podcast at theminimalists.com. Let us know that you're a Patreon subscriber if you are, so we can prioritize your message. Our first question today is from Mandy. Hello, my name is Mandy from Virginia. I'm calling because I have a question. Me and my family are going environmentally friendly, and I found no value in items that contain my plastic and are harmful to the environment. But I noticed a lot of the environmentally friendly things are so expensive, and my husband hasn't yet gotten a new job for us to be able to afford that. If there's any advice you could give on environmentally friendly things that don't break the bank, how do I cope with the feelings of I know what makes me environment, you know, um, I know what gives me value and like declutters, but I can't afford it. Like what would be your advice on that? Thank you. Well, Mandy, if you're a longtime listener of the show, you know I don't have any advice for you, but I think we have some observations here. Zach, I'd love to start with you because what I've found is sometimes the most environmentally friendly product is the product that's left on the shelf. And we often don't think about that option. It's like, should I buy the glass bottle or the plastic bottle or whatever? And sometimes that makes sense. Yeah, I totally identify with this question. I don't want to buy more plastic. I don't want to contribute to what's going on and uh, the polluting that's happening right now. But also, maybe the best way to not contribute to that is to reduce the amount of things that we consume. Do you have any insights here? I think that's the best advice in the world right there. We have been trained into being consumers as an identity. And basically, if you're not a company or a consumer product yourself, then you're then you're called a consumer. And it's an interesting branding that the industries have managed to brand us consumers because historically, uh, you go into any indigenous culture and there are no consumers. There's only producers. And so subtly, we were trained out of producing our lives and really taking control of our futures as sovereign beings. And so we have outsourced life in a lot of ways to companies that were more than happy to, you know, take on that role for us. And it only takes a few weeks, I think, for you to reprogram a lot of that brain. And so I think one of the best things an American consumer can do is, you know, given the restraints of our economics and everything else, to start to plan for that trip into an indigenous environment. And so there's no greater gift that you'll give your children for sure. So if you've got a family, start thinking about at what age would be the right age for us to expose those kids to a culture that is inherently, you know, unawares of a consumer lifestyle. And that could be uh, as cheap as what my family did. We drove down in our 1978 Malibu station wagon, no air conditioning to Mexico and spent time down there when I was 18. My youngest brother at the time was eight. And so you kind of look at the ages of your kids and then you plan out that trip. And, you know, it was basically a few gas tanks to get down into an environment that was just so radically different. And I grew up in a, you know, low-income housing and, you know, didn't have money to 
to spend uh, on travel. My parents didn't have money for us to, to be traveling globally, but they did something brilliant you know, before we got down to Mexico, which was every summer we would uh, volunteer to sponsor an individual or a family through the Department of Economics at the university that was near us. Uh, they would bring in these internationals uh, that were usually doing some postdoctoral study or something like that, and we would put them up in our home. And so my parents were able to bring the world to us even though we couldn't get to them. And so I was raised around some fascinating people who became some of our best friends as a family, and they started to shape our reality through that. So I think those are some of some of the things that strike my mind there. Find yourself into a, a producer environment and uh, realize that uh, for vast majority of human history, there has been no need to consume because we knew nature was abundant and we could be part of that. Now, Alex, we live in a society, and you talk about this in Ordinary Soil, um, which is historical fiction, but it feels like a memoir yeah, in ways. It is. And so when I look at a book like this, I, I think to live in a society we live in now, we do imagine ourselves as consumers and we all need some stuff. People often imagine as the minimalist and the minimalist podcast, you know what? They must be against things. They must be anti-consumption. Right. We're not against anti-consumption. We all need to consume some stuff. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that I, as an individual, am a consumer. Right. It means that I need access to certain things. And I think the quandary that Mandy is dealing with now is she's been told two things. One is she's been told you are a consumer and therefore you are polluting the planet and that is bad. Right. But also... Lots of guilt there. Yes. We're going to guilt you into that. But also, the only way to get out of that is now to upgrade the things that you're purchasing, buy better things, more expensive things, eco-friendly things. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insights around that? You know, I think kind of going off of what Zach mentioned, it's very, it's actually the heart of the message of that book. Uh, and it's actually a minimalist message in a way also. It's um, you get out what you put in, right? In all things, in your body, in the soil, in your mind in your heart, in your relationships, in everything. And so for somebody like Mandy, she's clearly already aware that she uh, needs and wants to make a change. It might be uh, taking off a little bit of the pressure for her just to look around her, kind of as Zach was saying, at her, her environment and seeing what kind of changes she could make there, really looking at what she's taking in and how that's affecting what's coming out. And that might affect your buying decisions also. There's other things you can do that, you know, like reuse, you know, containers and that kind of thing. But like on a more, on a broader like life scale, it's really important to look at, you know. And that was something that as I started doing the research for this book, which a buddy called Faction, right? It's like a between fiction and facts, right? It's, yes. And um, I found that, that so much, um, so much of our trouble comes down to this very simple truth that you can't get away from, which is that what you put in mm. is what you get out. Mm. And so that's something I would suggest to Mandy just to take a, take a look at that. I think about uh, Dr. Bush's comment about identifying ourselves as consumers and that bit of history that he gave us there is so profound because you think about other roles that we play in life or other things that we do, like breathing, talking, Walking, sleeping, sneezing. Imagine if we spoke in this way. I am a sneezer. I am a breather. I am a talker. I am a sleeper. No, you're not any of those things. You are one who sleeps, one who talks, one who breathes, one who sometimes sneezes, but you're not any of those things. What happens to your identity, the way you show up for your life when you see yourself as being synonymous with things that are merely an expression of your, your humanity. And when it comes to consumption, when we step back from that idea that I am a consumer, but rather I am a creator, I am one who consumes, but as part of a larger process of producing, then you start to bring a sense of agency and artistry to everyday life. Mm. Because when you show up, you show up as someone who is always interacting with your environment, not treating yourself as a passive receptacle of treasure, and pleasure that other people are pouring into. And that's just an entirely different mindset. And that kind of thing can bring creativity to these sorts of challenges where you're trying to figure out how do I negotiate the way I want to interact with my stuff and the differences that I have with the people that I'm around. I want to get more practical for a moment so we can address Mandy's question head on. 
I think sometimes when we are shown two options and we're told, okay, product A, terrible plastic, it leaches into your food and water. Product B, more expensive, but it is good for the environment. It is environmentally (laughs) friendly, right? Now, there are a few flaws with that. Flaw number one is, well, option C is going without. That's always an option. And recognizing that with anything that we do, we have that as an option. But I think the second part of this is, you know what? There are a lot of costs that go beyond the price tag. So what is the cost of buying the cheap plastic thing? What's the cost to your health? What's the cost to your habitat? What's the cost to the people around you? What are the negative externalities and how will that affect other people? And these are all questions that we don't ask or if we do ask them, it's well after we've purchased the thing that was a little bit cheaper, right? And so sometimes it makes more sense to spend more money, but actually end up with fewer long-term costs on the products that we own. As a minimalist, here's a weird paradox. I get far more value from the few items I own than if they were watered down by hundreds of thousands of useless plastic junk trinkets. The number of things that we own is not a marker for our, our well-being. In fact, quite often, there's an inverse correlation. The average American household has 300,000 items in it, and that would be awesome if it was bringing us more joy and contentment, but it's actually bringing us more clutter and more disruption, more distraction. It's getting in the way of that joy and contentment. And we don't think about these negative externalities of our consumption. I buy the thing because I'm a consumer and that thing is supposed to make me happy. When it doesn't do its job, I need to buy a better thing, a more environmentally friendly thing. Maybe if I am eco-friendly, then that will make me happier. No. Happiness is a byproduct. And we can buy things that amplify our life or enhance our experience of life. And we can buy things that don't pollute the planet. But if we consume less, then we produce less waste. And I think fundamentally, that is also a byproduct. I didn't step into minimalism because I thought it was the environmentally friendly thing to do. Turns out that it was, though. By consuming less stuff, I don't have all of the same junk that I was producing before. Alex, you mentioned shame and guilt, and I think that is part of this. I feel guilty for the things I've purchased in the past. Well, I'm here to let you know you can let go of that guilt because there's nothing you can do about the things you've done in the past, but you can begin again. Dr. Bush, when we went to the event for Ordinary Soil, at the end of it, you said something that was shocking to me, and I thought maybe you could illuminate it here on the show. You said that one of the unexpected byproducts of much of our carbon emissions might be a, a rebirth for the planet in a way. Can you expand on that? Yeah, <clears throat> I think I can back up, you know, to to your extremely important point there around the hidden costs of, you know, things, the unintended consequences of technology ultimately. There's actually a great book called that, The Un- Unintended Consequences of Technology, written by one of the geniuses coming out of Uganda. He's just a preternatural, extraordinary being, but he... Um, raised in the most abject poverty and parents uh, were killed at a young age when he was eight. So he ended up raising his two-year-old brother and taking care of his blind grandmother uh, from the age of eight forward and ends up graduating number one from his class uh, in Berkeley. And so he's just got one of these life stories that just defies all logic and reality of, of drive in a human being. And what, what his observation is, is you jump from one world to the other, um, is that people are unaware of their place, in, essentially, in the, in the United States. Uh, and I think it's starting to trickle down to the world over. You can now go to Uganda or other rural you know, in, in environments where there's great poverty, and that same loss of sense of place is happening. And when you lose the sense of place that you're consuming in, then you lose that unintended consequences awareness. And so tuning back into place and r- maybe going out in the morning and just a second or two of barefoot time on your land and be like, this is, I'm indigenous to this planet. We are all earthlings. 
well, maybe there's a few that aren't on the planet, but there, there's... Nicodemus <laughs> is in here right <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Everybody in the room at the moment that is visible as, as, as Earthling. So we've got this situation where we are indigenous to a land and you get that deep sense of place when you just spend a few seconds look, watching a sunrise and your cup of tea that takes on a different thing. And like you were saying, these hidden consequences of microplastics in, in your tea bag or whatever it is, those those things ultimately add up to the cost of a human species. We're going extinct as a human species for the amount of endocrine disruption from our herbicides, pesticides, and microplastics. That's basically the story of how the world is going extinct right now. Those basically two chemicals, one glyphosate and one microplastics. And those unintended consequences are bringing our entire species to our knees and our children and grandchildren will have the worst you know, disease processes that we can possibly imagine. And we're not calculating that into that $1.99 price on the shelf or at the Big Mac you know, purchase point. And so you can't overemphasize the cost of our current behavior. The cost of our current behavior is destruction of planet and humanity. And so instead of consumers, one practical way of thinking of your decisions of that is to shift to the concept of I'm an investor. And so if I'm not a consumer, what am I? Well, maybe I don't feel like a producer. Maybe I'm not making the things that I feel like I need because I'm spending so much time where I feel like most of my time is raising my kids or most of my time is doing my nine to five job that doesn't seem to do anything. So how? So start being an investor and invest your monies in your own health, in your own you know, environmental inputs as you consume your products. And that investor mentality, you get to start to look for dividends. And the dividends can be almost immediate when you make those changes. And so expanding your value system beyond the dollar ninety nine to say, hey, I'm going to see how I feel as a being, as my body and my mind in a week if I make these three investments at the grocery store. I'm going to pay that extra 45 cents for that product. And I'm going to make another dollar on that product. Okay, I invested three and a half extra dollars at the grocery store on a $65 ticket. And I'm going to see how I feel in a week. And my bet is you're going to actually know it by the time you're going to sleep that night is you're simply sleeping better for the small investments you made in your value system that aligns you back to a planet that you live on. And then you wake up in the morning, take your shoes off and feel that grass. And you're saying, I invested in that earth. I invested in my health on that earth. And so that investor mentality, I think, is something that moves you out of the scarcity mentality in being pigeonholed as a consumer to an abundance mentality of a high net worth investor. Because ultimately, there's no higher net worth than your moment of life that you're living in right now. So that transition is important. But as typical, I'll, I'll go and answer something thing that you didn't even ask me. And so we'll go back to, what did you ask me? That is a genius <laughs> observation, though. Like, that was the that answer. That is such a great way of looking at it, man. That, that is like, because it's a literal investment, right? We're talking about money here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And we're talking about a literal investment in your health. And uh, wow, what a great way to put it. Well, Alex, I also think that, and we'll circle back to the carbon emissions thing, because I think it's important here. But guess what? You can go out and buy 300,000 eco-friendly products today. You're not improving the planet through your purchases. And that's another lie that we've been told. If you just buy more environmentally friendly things, and then marketers, because there aren't regulations around a lot of this, some people say, well, our products are actually carbon negative. And that doesn't even make any sense <laughs> no, to me, man. right? But it's like, if you buy 10 of our bottles, it's like you removed a million <laughs> yeah. plastic bottles out of the ocean. <laughs> right. It's like, well, no, you're just making that up. You're, mar you're, you're doing the thing. There's this guy, I've got to find it for a future episode in Alabama. He, um, he rebrands foods. Like he'll make cotton candy a health food because he'll use all the non-regulated terms and he'll say, look, it's gluten-free. It's, you know, um, mm -hmm. he'll use whatever, uh, natural and artificial sw sweeteners. And he'll use all of these terms. And you realize that through marketing, we can lie pe to people in a way that A, makes them feel guilty, creates a new problem, and guess what? Our product has a solution to that problem you didn't even know you had. And that's quite often what happens with these eco-friendly products. Yeah, you're probably doing some things that aren't great for the environment. The way to solve that isn't through a solution. The solution ends up being the problem here. Oh, you know what? I'll just get a bunch of tote bags instead of the brown paper bags when well, then if you buy, you know, thousands or hundreds of tote bags, now you're doing something else to the environment. However, I do want to circle back to the 
carbon emissions thing, because that insight was yeah. so counterintuitive to me. Yeah. And I thought maybe you could elucidate it for our audience. Yeah. So there's many, many disruptions of plastics on the earth, and most of it, it revolves back to this carbon story. And so the, since about 2006, the word carbon has been demonized as kind of the problem of the planet. And of course, most of the time it's talking about CO2 and fossil fuel kind of burning and things like this. It turns out, though, biologically, carbon is actually the most important substrate that we can speak of if we're going to talk about life. Uh, perhaps you've heard of a course in college called organic chemistry, and perhaps you've suffered through an organic chemistry course. It was my least favorite course <laughs> that I ever took. And you're basically just memorizing a bunch of weird shapes on paper and trying to remember if it's a benzene or whatever the heck it is. And it just seems so ludicrous. And I was like, this is absolutely boring. But what they never freaking told me was that we are about to teach you the fundamental structure of life itself. And not a single cell would exist without this carbon relationship. And if they had pitched it that way, it would have been a lot more intriguing. If they had storytelled the, the experience of being human is in the, the sacred geometry of these carbon molecules, that would have been kind of a riveting thing. But instead they pitch it as if, you know, you're some sort of, you know, abstract artist and you need to, you know, assign random Latin terms to abstract art. The problem of that education that creates abstract knowledge bases is it makes it very easy for industry or governments to manipulate the value system around those abstract thoughts. And so if you had been imbued with a sense of awe and wonderment about carbon when you went through your basic chemistry courses, it would have been much harder for the government to tell you that carbon is the poison that's killing the planet in you. But because the, our education system is inherently abstract, we are vulnerable to others assigning value systems and, and guilt, shame, fear paradigms on the reality we live in. Life does not do harm. Life is inherently pushing for more life. And oftentimes it does that through death. So it doesn't, it's not that and nothing happens and nothing bad can happen. It's that life, even in a death, is looking for an explosion of new opportunity. And so a single oak tree falls. If you genetically sequence that oak trunk, it's one species, very few genes. As soon as that hits the forest floor and it's death, genetically sequence the trunk one year later, 100,000 species. So if you can go from one species to 100,000 species through a death process, you're starting to get a glimpse of what life does. So what the heck is carbon? Carbon is basically the communication network for the energy potential of the future. And so when death happens, a huge burst of carbon will move out of that structure to signal that there's a new energy source. There's an opportunity for new life to happen. CO2, methane, all of these things are discharged from plants that are dying, humans that are dying. Any organic material, plant, animal, otherwise, is, gonna, is a huge carbon sink. It's a cute reservoir of energy. The building blocks for that energy system is CO2 in the atmosphere. And so for your government to come along and say CO2 is a poison and we're going to start pumping that stuff out of, out of the atmosphere because it's killing the planet, all I can tell you is they are absolutely fundamentally wrong because CO2 has never poisoned this earth. CO2 is always the building block for the new potential energetics or metabolism for life. And so when we see lots of CO2 in the atmosphere, as we did at many verdant, extraordinary times in, on this planet's history, it always sets up biology for its next expression or exuberance of, of life potential. Because the more potential energy storage you have, the more you can, more work you can do at the biologic level to become more complex, which is to say more intelligent, more plugged into the universe. And so we had to go through a huge extinction event. 90% of the world died with the last extinction, which was due to the death of topsoil. We are now, rather than the asteroid that did that 55 million years ago, we're the existential threat. We are the you know, figurative asteroid hitting the planet right now because we're killing the topsoil at a near similar rate that the asteroid did. Uh, you know, the asteroid came in, hit a huge layer of dust, and over the next decades, the topsoils were choked out by that layer of anoxic injury. We're coming along with chemicals now and overplowing, and we're starving the, the earth of its opportunity to do carbon cycling. So when the topsoil dies, the earth cannot breathe. And so we've basically induced a, a, a situation of emphysema where there's plenty of gas to be exchanged. The person with emphysema is breathing you know, more than I do. They might be breathing 40 times a minute, and I breathe eight, but they can't 
utilize that resource because the lung surface has disappeared. And so as we denude, 97% of our arable soils are now denuded of nutrients and, and uh, microbiology that can cycle that life. The earth is, is in a long breath hold. All of the potential life in, in that carbon resource, the CO2 in the atmosphere that should be coming back into the soil to create blood, blood uh, sugars and fats, so carbohydrates and fats. Those are long chains of carbons that are glued together CO2 with stored sunlight. So the chlorophyll in the plant takes CO2 and sunlight stores it in a double carbon bond. A long chain of double carbon bonds is called sugar or fat. Another long chain carbon is called plastic. Another long chain carbon is called tires. Another long chain carbon is called farm waste. And so the vast majority of what we call waste on this planet is massive gigatons of potential energy. And all of the CO2 in the atmosphere is the batteries of the future for life on planet Earth. And so we need to reverse our fear, guilt, shame paradigm that industry and governments have programmed in us to guilt us into some sort of effort towards change and realize that that abstract argument is actually accelerating the death of the planet because we're not realizing that CO2 is not the problem. The, the lack of lung tissue is the problem. Mm. We need to heal the soils of this planet so that Mother Earth will take her first breath. And when she breathes in, folks, it's going to get really beautiful around here. Well, speaking of soil, Mandy, I'd love to send you a copy of Ordinary Soil in Alabama. If you could reach out to, to Mandy, I'd appreciate it. I'd like to move over to some social media questions here. We've got one from YouTube. This one's from Barbara. Food manufacturers use cheap, fake ingredients in their products that add chemicals to our food, while our medical system seems more interested in working with drug manufacturers to treat symptoms instead of addressing the root problems. Are these issues feeding into each other? How do we opt out of this madness? Well, before we answer this, I found that sometimes we have to talk about these really deep, difficult to discuss topics, overwhelming topics with some levity. And so I think this food clip sums up the problem nicely. Take a look at this. Yo, manufacturing this food getting kind of expensive, bro. How are we going to make it cheaper? Put poison in it. Poison is cheap. How are we going to put poison in the food and get away with it? Well, poison is an ingredient, technically. <laughs> so put it in the ingredients next to the other less poisonous stuff. Ain't nobody going to read that shit. Bro, <laughs> you so fucking smart. But what if, they, what if they find out there's poison in it? We take it out, cut some checks, put new poison in it. You're a genius. You're a genius. Ho. <laughs> Shit, you are so fucking smart and intelligent. Uh, <laughs> wow. Dr. Bush, this, I know we're joking about it, but there's something really deeply serious about this. When 60 plus percent of our food is processed food, we're essentially putting poison in the food. Whether or not we know that we're consuming poison, we're, consu we're consuming a lot of things that create disease and dysfunction in our lives. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, this goes really deep into our current food system. The The concept of processed foods, uh, you know, back in the 1980s, the problem was high fructose corn syrup. By the 1990s, our problem started to be glyphosate, which is the primary weed killer that is in the environment today. Today, we, we put about 4 billion pounds of glyphosate into our global soils, and it's a water-soluble toxin that ends up in our rainwater. About 85% of the rain that falls in the United States contaminated. About 85% of the, the air we breathe is contaminated. So, we're truly steeped in these these chemicals now. And so those were the problems, I think, you know, that we identified in the 1980s and 90s as saying, here's the, the crisis with cheap, processed, genetically modified, you know, commodities crops that get churned out at millions of acres on pennies on the dollar so we can make cheap food. But unfortunately, the, the concept of processed food really dates back to the late 1800s when, when the rails did start coming off that far back on human health. And the process that, that is probably decreasing the life force within our food more than anything else is long supply chains. And so when you pull food out of the ground and you transport it for great distances, it typically requires you to, to pick the food unripe. And then what we do today is we ripen food that's been picked too early, 
while it's in transit by pumping ethylene gas into the trucks or into the into the containers that are shipped in. And so the ethylene gas forces a, a, a process of um, basically softening the fruit or vegetable that you're consuming so that it's actually relatively ripe when it gets to you. But the further you are from this soil event, when that gets plucked out of the soil, the, the more dead the, the, the food is. And so the oils are breaking down in there, carbohydrates are breaking down in there, all the enzymatic function that exists in the cell of the carrot or the microbiome that was on the carrot was pulled, all of that is, is dying quickly. All the way down to the very water structure of the, the fruit or vegetable is actually in a deterioration from the moment it gets picked. And that deterioration accelerates over time. You, know, you can just witness this pretty easily if you if you you know pick an apple off of a tree and then set it next to the tree on the ground and then come back a week later and look at the sister of that apple that's still on the tree versus the apple that you've picked off the tree. And that one's already rotten. It's got holes in it and it's deteriorating very quickly. The reason it's deteriorating is because at the moment it was picked, it's reversed a growth process into a death process. And so when you remove something from its nature, it starts to die. And the further you know from that vine you are, the more death you're consuming. And so a very sad reality is most of the food that we are consuming is not only lacking the nutrients and the vitality of a living life force kind of food, it's also near dead. And so it's... it's a, stunning thing to realize that you actually don't know what it feels like to be good from your food because you've never ate feel food that makes you feel good. And to do that, you have to get really close to the garden. And uh, I've gotten, you know, more and more passionate about this closeness over the years, but it was actually a, a deer that I ironically kind of taught me the deepest lesson on this. I live in the woods of Virginia in my log cabin that my son and I built together. And, and, so I can't get too much more like nature-esque. And, I, and then I walk around thinking and talking and studying in my science lab, all this stuff. And so you'd think that I'd be pretty clued in. But a tree fell down across my driveway. So I'm walking out one morning with my chainsaw, going to go clean this thing up. And... I love nature because our body knows it better than our mind does. And so oftentimes when you're walking nature, suddenly your body will freeze and you don't even know why. And so I had one of these freeze moments and looked around trying to figure out why I froze and realized that there was a deer just like three or four feet from me, super close to me, but it was so still and it was like kind of blended in the, the way the sunlight was coming through the trees. It was so camouflaged. I freeze and this deer is just staring at me and I, you know, goose, goosebumps all over now. And the deer, almost as if it's just like telepathically communicating me, is so present with me, eye contact and everything. And instead of running away, which is the only thing deer would typically do and should have run away by the time I was out there. So for no explanation, this thing is waiting for me. I freeze. It bends down and picks a tomato off of this little volunteer tomato plant that I hadn't even planted, but seed had blown over or something. So there it is with the side of my driveway, this tomato. And he plucks a, a tomato off the vine. And then sits there, stares at me and chews it for a few times and then just goes bolting off. Mm. And I suddenly realized in that second, my God, the deer just showed me that there is no animal in nature that eats off the vine, you know, fruit picked off the vine. It always eats from the vine. Mm. And that just tripped me out in that second because I had been studying water structure and all this. And so suddenly I was realizing that deer will never show any signs of aging through its entire life cycle because it's always consuming the food at the point at which it's growing. We are only consuming food at the point at which it's dying. So the life force that an animal is getting off the vine versus a human that's 3,000 kilometers from their, their tomato plant that that thing was plucked from, you can't compare the two. We cannot get life force out of our food when we have these long supply chains. So does every bite of food you need need to come from the soil? Probably not. There's some minerals and things that you might be able to extract out of there. But if... You start living a life where at least once a day you bent down and bit a leaf off of a basil plant that's growing in a pot outside your house, or you bent down and actually plucked a tomato off the vine, which I now routinely do. I, I don't pick the tomato and then pop it in my mouth. I bend down and bite it off the vine. It is a trippy experience because a tomato tastes totally different on the vine, it turns out, because on the surface of the tomato is this, this like almost infinitesimally invisible hair-like uh, structure on top of the tomato. And as soon as you touch the tomato, your fingers knock that off. And so you think a tomato is smooth because you've never tasted it. But if you pay attention and you, you feel it on your tongue, you realize it's almost got this little fuzz on it, like a peach fuzz that's 
tiny, tiny little fuzz. And that fuzz carries the microbiome that allows for the nutrients within the tomato to become bioavailable to my body. And the, and the lycopene, which kills cancer, is suddenly getting into my bloodstream and I can kill cancer with the tomato that's never been puck, plucked from the vine. So this is, when we start talking about processed food, we need to really take a big look at just what is the process in which the food gets to us and how do we start to reinvent our relationship to nature? Yeah, there's a, a character, like really the only healthy one in that book is uh, is a woman named Jessica. And she does what what Zach's talking about in terms of she tries to cultivate. She's got the land, but, uh, you know, she's got whatever, 1,200 acres her family does. Um, but she cultivates this half acre the best that she can. And she eats off it, you know, not everything she doesn't, but she is good as much as she can. She eats off it and she's the only healthy one in the book, right? So there's a doctor character in there that kind of puts two and two together. He's looking around at his environment. Everybody's got all these chronic diseases. Every, you know, there's, there, we can go into that later, but there's this one healthy person and what's she doing different? That's what she's doing different. And we can't all do that, right? We can't all have a half an acre to farm or even a backyard sometimes is a hard for a lot of folks. But you can have the awareness when you're going, you know, as far as eating seasonally, right? For example, and trying to get to know your farmers at the farmer's market and that kind of thing. Even growing something on your windowsill starts to connect you a little bit more, right, to what you're eating. And I think that that's what, what Zach's getting at. That connection is huge. And I think that's an important concept for everybody who's thinking like, I want to eat more eco-friendly. I want to be more connected. The farmer market, there's a lot of fears. Well, is it an organic farmer's market? Is it not? The first question you can ask is when was it picked? And nine times out of 10, it was picked that morning. And so they will get up at four o'clock in the morning. They'll harvest a bunch of radishes and carrots and everything else. And they'll pop it in the truck and drive to the farmer's market. You're only a few hours from that thing. And so I'd much rather go to the farmer's market. And even if the farmer's not certified organic, Organic, I'd rather consume that than an organic carrot that's already, you know, three weeks divided from the soil that's at, you know, quote unquote, California organic there. Mm -hmm. And and the unintended consequence of that California organic sitting on my Virginia shelf is unmeasurable. Like there's no way that's good for me or the planet to eat an organic carrot from California out of season compared to go to the farmer's market and get what was picked that morning and experience that. And we don't think about it because now I can go to Walmart and get blueberries in February in Michigan. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, it's what we've always done, right? Well, no, we've done it for yeah, right. a few decades, right? right? Yeah. And we've gotten really good at logistics, not understanding that quite often because we've improved our lives in this area, we've have this cascade that we don't even really understand the consequences of it yet because it's a mill you. It's not like, oh, uh, you know what, TK, you ate those blueberries last week and looks like you have cancer now this week. <laughs> yeah. it, it doesn't work that way. I tell you one of the most profound changes we've made when, since we moved up to Ojai is every weekend we go to, there's a farmer's market there and there's no, they're not, not all, everyone there is certified organic, but it's a no spray farmer's market. So there's no glyphosates, none of the junk. And maybe they can't afford to go through the entire certification process, but they're not spraying their vegetables. And many of them are picking them that day or the day previous. So it's relatively close to the pick. And also we have a, a local butcher shop there as well for the meat that we eat. And so understanding that we have a relationship with real food. We don't have any processed food in our house now. And that was a dramatic change for us because it's so convenient. We've become paralyzed by the amount of convenience we need in our lives. And you know what? It's a little bit more difficult to cook every meal. It's a little more difficult to seek out the things that are life-giving as opposed to the things that are quick and convenient. I mean, we call them convenience stores. Where I grew up, there wasn't really a grocery store nearby, but there were several convenience stores, liquor stores. And so you could buy Cheetos and you could buy whiskey and you could buy beer and you could buy candy. You could buy a bunch of nonsense that in the moment tastes really good because it's hyper palatable, but it's not filled with the, nutri the nutrition, the nutrients that we need to make us feel alive. 
that's the investment he's mm. talking about, right? It's that extra step to cook for yourself or to spend the extra money to farmer's market or whatever it might be. I mean, that's that's what Zach's talking about. It's that those small incremental investments that, like he said, can have such an impact probably by the time you go to sleep that night, you know, it makes a really big difference. Nutrient availability is such an interesting thing to study because uh, it's very difficult to get the best nutrients into a human body if you look at it as just a human body. And and what I mean by that is humans are the human cell is not designed to metabolize, break down, traffic, move nature into your body. Human cells are there to receive from nature. Mm. And so what you need to deliver is the microbiome. And that microbiome exists in your gut, on your skin. It exists also inside of every human cell in the form of these little tiny bacteria that we call mitochondria. And so you are teeming with life that is there to provide nature to the receiving state of the human cell. But the human cell cannot create its own health or vitality. It cannot deliver nutrients. And so it is only in a receiving process. And so... It's impossible that humans are a, a construct of nature from which life comes. Humans were devised as that neurologic system, that vessel to receive so much life within it that it would exhibit intelligence and a connection to an awareness of the divine, perhaps, an awareness of the beauty of nature. And so we are designed by nature to receive an infinite glory from her so that we can see her. I think that's the entire equation of what is it to be human? You are inherently a vessel for gifting that is there to just see the beauty of that which is going to give to you. So what does that mean for you know, nutrient availability? If you can't actually create that, that you know, supply chain into your own bloodstream or into the, the individual cell, what does your relationship nature play in that? And this is what we're showing with these microbiome extracts that we're doing from fossil soils is... If you, if you give a human today, now this is moving into our clinical studies, not just our microbiome or, or microbiology studies in our lab. So in clinical studies, if we give people a really high-grade liposomal uh, turmeric, for example, and so we give them five grams orally and then test their urine 30 minutes later or 60 minutes later, there is no turmeric that ever got in, in there. Contrast that with if we add the turmeric to these, these microbial metabolites, we find out that the microbes are making the stuff that carries the turmeric into the human cell. And so no matter how much turmeric you feed the human, if they are in a sterile state, if they are not expressing life within them, if they don't aren't in touch with that complex ecosystem of the microbiology of their soils, of the air, the healthy air, if you're not in that healthy ecosystem, you cannot get the nutrients into your own body. When we put it in that turmeric dissolved into this, you know, the, the, the liquid supplement from the microbiome, you can get 3,000 nanograms of, of turmeric per milliliter of urine. Like it's, it's like almost overwhelmed by turmeric in the mm -hmm. body. So, and that's at, at a fraction of the amount of turmeric in, in the thing. So you can give 10 times less turmeric and get way more into the body than you did. And so our whole supplement industry has become this like sledgehammer approach. Well, if you take 10,000 of this or 1 million watts of vitamin D, you're going to have lots of health. Mm. Why are we using these sledgehammers? It's because we're not using the interface of nature to get these nutrients into our own body. And so there's a deep lesson in this. And, and we're playing this out even in our big cattle studies. We did 12,000 cattle trial. And we were able to show that if, if the microbiome is involved with their food, if we, if we use these extracts from the microbiome before they eat. They eat less food because they're getting more nutrients with less calories. Why is the world getting so obese? Because we have to eat so many calories to get those few, uh, so, so little nutrients. And so we're going after nutrients as a biologic force. We, our brain's not counting calories. Our brain's really looking for nutrients to do the work, enzymes, protein structures, all this stuff. If we need to eat 10 times more calories to get the same nutrient load, then we're going to become obese almost inevitably. And so when you add back the microbiome, you see these cows suddenly eating less and getting more muscle than their partners over there that are eating more calories. And so it's a beautiful demonstration that nature was designed to give us life. When we take nature out, we cannot receive. Why don't, why don't you read what's on your tea bag? I just saw that. <laughs> you know, what you, is this like my vision test yeah. to see if I need my, my glasses <laughs> yeah. here? What, want me to read it? Oh, one touch. Okay, yeah, go ahead. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. <laughs> William Shakespeare. Mm. Yes. 
We, we planned that specifically. Yeah, nice job. <laughs> nice work, Alabama. <laughs> Good job, Alabama. No problem. Y- you know, I want to talk about the pharmaceutical aspect of this because I think it's part of the question and I don't want to demonize the medical industry. The problem is something that you all are trying to address here. And the problem is like pharmaceuticals have a great marketing department. This basketball game is brought to you by Pfizer, right? But the basketball game is never brought to you by the sun or the soil. The sun has the worst marketing department. It's the best thing ever, but terrible marketing on its end. Like, can we get a slogan or a billboard, something? And the irony is like, what happens is we forsake the things that are free until we need to pay the cost financially, also in terms of our health. We're paying a cost because we forsook those things for so long. Could you touch on that a bit? Yeah, I think in some ways what you're pointing to there is just a complete disconnect from our our capacity to, to be in touch with our intuition or perhaps even our own capacity for perception. And so our perception and intuition have been so dulled down in a world in which we are so encouraged to work and think and function from an abstract reality that we have in our heads. I don't need to tell you that blueberries are a bad idea in December in Michigan. All you have to do is go taste that blueberry and be present enough to taste the thing that they call a blueberry. There's absolutely nothing about that blue thing you just stuck in your mouth that tastes like the blueberry that you used to have. But you don't even take the time to taste that because you're so busy getting the emails done, you know, running running the errands that you got to do, mm-hmm. running through your own insecurity list and beating yourself up over the head that you got four more wrinkles and being worried about whatever that means for you. The, the body is an unbelievable biologic laboratory. Every split second, you've got 70 trillion cells that are sensing the world around you. And if you're living a life where you can't feel that, then you're missing the whole point of everything. And this is where you become so vulnerable to manipulation. If you can't feel yourself, then you're going to believe somebody else's story of what you're feeling. You're going to let somebody else give you the narrative that you're going to start living your life by. But again, if you would just feel the hand of your grandmother this week, if you will just feel the skin on on the face of a child, if you'll just feel what it tastes like to eat a blueberry off the vine, it will absolutely change the way you're living your life. And so we don't have to make an abstract argument for minimalism. You will simply start consuming less when you get more out of it. And you'll stop needing the solutions a decade from now, because that's what happens with the pharmaceuticals. They're, they can be really helpful and life-saving at, after we have this point where we actually end up needing them because we forsook nature for so long. I think that's what I was trying to get at here is, is that's why I always love having Dr. Bush on the show. To me, he's nature's marketing department. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> and it's finally making it interesting in a way and compelling in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming. Because yeah, Zach can get up here and talk about the the cells and the nucleus and the Petri dish and all these things. But then you can make it really compelling with someone like Alex where you're like, okay, I've got something here. I've got a story. Let me tell you a story about something. And it leads back to everything you're talking about and the science and the data and the information, but in a way that I can digest it. But gentlemen, thank you for that. I appreciate that. There's a great quote that we use all the time in Farmer's Footprint that um, humans are not made of cells, we're made of stories. And I think I think that is a potent reminder of the fact that we actually create our own realities through the stories we believe and perhaps more potently the stories that we actually tell. So, so it's important for us to back up and start taking responsibility for the stories we're living by. And if we feel bad or we're mad at somebody... That, that's on us because we it, we allowed, we outsourced the story to somebody else. And and so we need to take back control of the story of our own lives and what we live by and the world we create, the health we create within ourselves. Last time you talked to Nicodemus, he was saying, Zach told me that we might be addicted to water. 
And I'm like, I don't know what you mean by it. He goes, I couldn't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, we have Dr. Zach Bush on the podcast today. So what the, what the hell was Nicodemus talking about? Well, we're actually addicted to a lot of things that are seem inherently good for us and are actually the foundations of life. And breath would be another one. We're very addicted to, to breathing uh, because we don't know how to breathe. And so uh, we tend to breathe. You know, if you look at a doctor's chart, we'll typically chart the, the number of respirations next to your heart rate and everything else. And typically be 16 to 20 is your typical average that a doc is. And you could argue that the doctors are too lazy to actually count. And maybe that's actually quite true. But the fact is they learned that 16 to 20 was the normal range. And the reason the reason that's so ridiculous is because the actual normal rate of breathing in a healthy being who's who's in their full capacity for breath is about four to eight. And so somehow we four X'd the rate of breathing as a normal phenomenon. And the phenomenon of not breathing well is that you are breathing at the top of your lung capacity. You're not actually breathing at the bottom of your lungs. You're way up at the apex because you actually haven't exhaled all day. And so because you never exhale, you can't take a breath in. So you have to take these little sips of breaths. So you have to take 16 or 18 tiny little breaths because you haven't taken the time to exhale. In the same way, water is this thing that we constantly have in front of us these days. And the reason is because this glass of water here is in a state that I cannot actually turn into the liquid crystal inside my cells that my body's actually craving. So as soon as water gets inside a human cell, it turns into a gel uh, and it functions as a liquid crystal. It can actually hold light energy just as a liquid crystal in your radio would. And so that, that liquid crystal that I'm craving is the interplay between H2O molecules and salt, electrolytes, not sodium chloride, but we're talking about you know 64 different mineral uh, salts that would come off the periodic chart with your interaction with the natural water system, whether it be a, a, salt, a, a spring fed thing that's coming out of the deep earth filtered through with all those minerals, uh, a river system, or bathing in the ocean. So water in all of its natural states is never just H2O. It's always a dance between energy in the form of minerals and electrolytes and these, these massively beautiful molecules of the H2O itself. What we've come to do is take all of nature out of the water and then we give you a bunch of H2O in a glass and be like, here, this will satiate you. You drink that glass, and you put it down. 20 minutes later, you're peeing that out because it couldn't get inside of your human cells because it had no interplay with nature. And so you're peeing it back out. Now you're thirsty again. So you're addicted to this constant intake of water to satiate a palate that's actually being driven by a desire for the water in a living state to get inside of itself. And it's the same reason that you overeat because you don't have availability of nutrients in the food as well. So for the same reason you're, you're, you're eating too many calories for too few nutrients, you're drinking too much water for too much, for too little life force within it. So the place to get that water is from our food, is what you're saying, as opposed to just this H2O that we have here. Yeah. Or you put it back into a living s system. And so, you know, obviously the best thing you can do is really get to the source of a spring. You know, spring water has a vitality and you know, it's almost unrivaled. The other place that you can see this is in a waterfall. And I, I would encourage everybody to start drinking from waterfalls again. It turns out that that water purifies itself. Everybody's afraid of like bacteria in the, in the fresh water or whatever. But water that's flowing at, at a rate of about three meters uh, a, a second, so a very fast flow of water, um, sterilize its, itself through the collision of water molecules through that fast flow state. So if you've got a fast flowing stream or a waterfall, it, you don't have to worry about it if it has GRD or not. And so taste what that waterfall tastes like for a moment and you're going to experience such an energizing thing. I was just in uh, Africa and, and after a long week in the bush, we found this waterfall that was just like the most you know, verdant, like piece of, of the garden eating experience. And we were full on tripping in this water, like having hallucinogenic effects from being in this water nearly because it was so energizing the body. You didn't have to drink it. You were standing and it was pounding your skin and you literally felt electrified. You were having such an intense awareness of presence. And it wasn't like a huge, intense waterfall. It was a relatively small waterfall, but the, the, intensity of the life force within this water was creating these extra pyramidal, extra perceptional kind of experience. And so it was really a wonderful reminder of nature wants you to go beyond physiology 
you're ultimately a, a quantum physics being that's chosen to be in a finite state of a body at the moment. And you are striving to feel what it feels like to be the universe again. To be the universe inside a human body, you must be in touch with the power of the universe, the living life force within your food, water systems, where you're bathing, etc. And the thing that keeps dragging this guy back out in the ocean to surf is he simply feels more alive by the time he comes back in. Would you say that's true? Yeah, absolutely. I've been comparing it. You know, there's a lot of ice bath talk, which is very, lots of people talking about ice baths. And, mm -hmm. and when I go out there, it's cold. It ain't ice bath cold, but it's pretty cold. You know, right now it's 60, 58 degrees. But um, I, when I go out there, I feel not only that sensation of, you know, my, my cells coming alive. Um, there's something that you're speaking to that I can't describe that keeps me going back. All I know is when I'm out, when I come out of the water, I'm a better person. And that's what matters, right? And I feel better. I, I treat people around me better. I, you know, I'm just a better person. And I think that's speaking to what you're saying. I don't know the mechanism. Now, now I kind of do. I, I think the other thing that can, you know, be exciting is that we can actually restructure dead water too. And so my practice at home is drop just a little bit of uh, Celtic sea salt into my glass of water and then squeeze just a bit of lime or lemon into it. And the interaction with the shift in pH and the alkalinity that you get in a lime or, or lemon combined with the, the, the uh, exciting kind of battery effect of, of salt when it hits water is I can re-energize the life force into that glass. So squeeze a lemon, like half a lemon into a 12 ounce glass, and then a pinch of, of you know, pink Himalayan salt or a great Celtic sea salt, and suddenly you have life force within that thing again. So you become, again, you become a, a curator or a culinary creator within your own glass of water again. And it tastes incredible. It's like the most satiating thing when you have that that combination. You're not going to want that glass of water again if you know you can have this other thing. You can have an alkaline source with, with this electrolyte burst. Um, that's not the same as alkaline water. Don't buy alkaline water. That's that's a bit of a marketing scam. But, but uh, there's a difference, unfortunately, between the word alkaline and alkalinity. Uh, alkalinity comes from your lime or lemon, which is actually a acid pH. Uh, so it's acid, but alkalinity describes the amount of, of protons or acid that it can absorb. So you, despite the fact of it being acidic, lime or lemon juice will absorb more acid out of your body. And so it's going to neutralize an acidic state. And so that lime, lemon, and salt combination in there is going to reinvigorate your water. And suddenly it's going to be able to get inside the cells. And while getting into the cells, it's going to reduce your inflammation. And so it's just a, a really beautiful dance that we could so easily teach our children is, you know, it, if you've been handed something that's not of nature, here's how you can become an artist within nature again. Start to paint nature back into the, the reality. And I would like to just kind of emphasize that with that first question that we began with. Maybe we, this kind of brings us towards some sort of conclusion here, but there was a concern that maybe eight courses for Thanksgiving was too much. But it does strike me that if Thanksgiving is that one meal a year where you actually cook your own food, and you actually share that with the people you love, make that a freaking 80-course meal. Do not relent in your fear of minimalism or the lack of minimalism in your life to care for one another through the food you cook for one another. There, it, there's nothing more powerful than love cooked into food. And this was just proved in the, at the University of Ohio in a, a total mistake, which is where all the beautiful things come out of science. Ohio, he's saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There are a few good things that come out. They, they, they did this research after LeBron left. <laughs> <laughs> so University of Ohio, they're trying, they're demonstrating all the potent carcinogen effect of herbicides, pesticides, and they're doing this in a in field of rabbits. And so um, field makes it sound like they're outside. Not at all. They're caged rabbits in this study and they're taking different cohorts or different groups of rabbits and exposing them to higher and higher levels of, of chemical uh, insult. And they're measuring the, the health consequences of all of this over a two-year study. And so an amazing, profound demonstration of the poison in our food. But there was this one cohort that was among the most poisoned food in there that just seemed bulletproof. They were just 
no inflammation, weren't getting any disease. And it's this outlier in this whole thing. And they finish the thing and they're just driving themselves crazy because it's screwing up their whole data set. And so they go back into the lab and they're like, well, was the poison getting in? The poison's definitely there. So finally, they're talking to the technician who's feeding the rabbit. And they're like, no, what exactly are you doing? And he says, oh, well, I take the rabbit out and I freaking love rabbits. And so I sit and pet them for 10 or 15 minutes and just tell them how beautiful they are and how much I love them. And then I feed them. The love this man was pouring into these rabbits completely ameliorated the amount of toxicity they were getting from the food. And so everything I've told you up to this point in this podcast is probably freaking you out that it's impossible to get food or water because you're not eating off the vine. It's impossible. But the way you reverse that whole thing, and this is important because many of us don't have access to high nutrient density food that was just picked today and everything else. Remember the power of serving food that's been cooked in love and you will take that fear, guilt, shame paradigm and just chuck it out the window. And so this Thanksgiving, when you sit down, I hope you did have the opportunity to prepare the food because there's something magical about chopping an onion and sauteing the, the spinach or whatever you're going to make there. You're going to have an opportunity to perceive the entire experience of nature as it comes into your kitchen. And so be aware that what you're doing is you're about to, to bake love into nature and you're going to serve that to the people you love the most. And for this, you're going to live long and you're going to become the great grandmother or the great grandfather that you want to be for your children because this is actually the secret to all of the blue zones around the world where people do actually live past 100 years frequently. And in those blue zones, we've found again and again that it's not the food they're eating, it's not the altitude, it's not their access to fresh water, it's not because they're surfing every day. It's because they eat in multi-generational units with oftentimes a large interchange between immediate family and external community. And so I learned this from this couple in Ikaria, which I've probably shared on this podcast before, but when I tried to, to pose the reason why their food was making them live so long, this gentleman stood up at the end of my toast, which was really beautiful, like 25 minute toast probably, because that's how I talk, but gave this thing. He said, you're completely wrong, doctor. And the reason we live long in Icaria is not because of what we eat. It's because we always set an extra chair at the table hoping somebody we don't know shows up to eat with us. We never ask each other in Icaria, what did you eat last night? But we always ask, who did you eat with last night? And for that, we live past 100 years. And so it was just such a humbling and rearrangement of my life, realizing that for all the science I know, for everything else, I've forgotten the power of being a human and witness to another human and of truly creating fellowship around food. And when food begins to be our source of fellowship again, we're going to be nutrified. We're going to be healthy for the food that we consume, regardless of how close or far we are perhaps from that regenerative future we're hoping for. And when we do start to cook our food and share it over thing, we're going to care more for the food and we're going to care more about the farmer that grew that food. And so I think it's going to be reorienting our whole society around what is the purpose of food? Is it really for calories or is it to create an opportunity for human fellowship, for sharing gratitude, for sharing uh, creativity and the rest? And that's going to help overcome this point at which we're at. Either we go extinct in our unaware consumption of poisons or we become aware and start to share love and life around food again. And we'll build that future almost immediately that we all know is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Zach Bush, Alex Warder. Wow. Where should we send folks? Obviously the book is out now. We'll put a link to this in the show notes, but where can people find your work, Alex? I am best found at alexwoodard.com. I, uh, uh, took a break away from the social media thing that just stuck. So that's the best way to go. Um, I love get it. on the email list there. I send out stories every once in a while. That's the the best place to go, alexwoodard.com. Dr. Bush, you want to talk about Farmer's Footprint and anything else you've got going on right now? We would love for you guys to get uh, in touch with this movement. And the book is actually a way to do that because Alex has really generously decided to donate all of the profits from this book to Farmer's Footprint. Uh, and so your purchase of the book is going to further support our nonprofits that are helping farmers tell a new story. And that's what our nonprofit is really focused on. I, I've 
spent years and years telling people of the toxicity of glyphosate and all this and made no impact. But when we started to allow farmers to tell their stories of their rediscovery of their relationship to their land and, and their rediscovery of economic prosperity rather than you know being a commodities marketplace victim, uh, it started to change the industry really quickly. And so, again, we are not made of sales, we're made of stories. And farmers are telling a very compelling story for a future that is right here, right now. And we need to support those farmers that are making the brave leap into this new new practice uh, for modern agriculture and perhaps a remembrance of a very long relationship to food and, and soil that has long kept our, our species alive and thriving. And so uh, ordinary soil is, is an access point there. Farmersfootprint.us is uh, your access point. If you're in the USA, we have Farmers Footprint Australia and New Zealand and UK as well, if you want in some of those other locations to help your farmers in your environment. Uh, but Farmers Footprint is, is a global community that's coming together. And we actually really need your help right now. We we could use your support. Uh, there, there's an opportunity for us to to really accelerate the number of farmers that are going through our programs, but we need more community support and buy-in. So if you can jump to farmersfootprint.us and give us some support at the end of this year, that would be a huge opportunity for for us to accelerate and reach more farmers that are each reaching thousands of, of American families uh, through the food they're producing. And so uh, we're ready to accelerate, but we need you to, to put the gas in the tank for us if you're willing. And I uh, would love for you to become part of the community. Uh, join the Garden Club. It's going to teach you and your children how to grow that garden in the backyard that perhaps you've been too intimidated to do. Uh, it's a super easy course uh, to to get excited about. And uh, it's amazing how fast you can feel proficient and capable in your own backyard to create a, a food system close enough to taste the tomato off the vine. Oh, how beautiful is that? Well, you've got our commitment here from The Minimalists. We're going to contribute as well. And so we'll ask the audience if they're interested. We'll put a link to Farmer's Footprint in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. I just want to take a moment and acknowledge both both of you for the work that you're doing. Nature's marketing department, and it needs it. Mm-hmm. And I'm really grateful that you decided to spend a few hours with us today. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, we're both really appreciative and helping get out the message. So grateful to be back with you guys. It's an inspiration. I'm glad to share time with each of you. It does make me feel more alive and as a better person when I get to hear your sense of humor and your love for life that you all bring. And thank you for reminding us to live a simple life that's full of riches. It's a, a really important message for a time in which we can deprogram our consumer behavior. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate what you guys have contributed to that mission over these decades. It's, it's immeasurable. Well, you certainly have an open invite anytime y'all are back in LA and want to stop by. Let us know. Much love. Alabama, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalists on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, X, and Threads. We are at The Minimalists on those platforms. Now, during the lightning round, we each have 60 seconds to answer your question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims over in the show notes at theminimalists.com slash podcast so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And by the way, if you want those minimal maxims to show up in your inbox every Monday, we have like seven or eight or nine minimal maxims every episode. Professor Sean's writing them down over in cursive, so I can't read them. But (laughs) thankfully, he transcribes them from cursive into computer font. And uh, they'll show up in your inbox every Monday. Theminimalists.email will email you all of our minimal maxims, all of the show notes. We'll never send you spam or junk or advertisements, but we will notify you anytime there is a new episode. By the way, quick programming note real quick. Next week, we do not have an episode. The studio is going to be closed next week. So on December 11th, there will not be a publicly available episode of The Minimalist. I know, <gasps> what are you going to do without it? Well, don't worry. If you're one of our lovely Patreon subscribers, we've got a special bonus episode in store for you. Otherwise, we'll be back in a couple of weeks into the public feed as well. All right, Alabama, lightning round. Looks like we have a question here from, I thought it said singing bird at first, but this one says sighing bird. Yes, they said, how do we develop an alternative to retail therapy that isn't just another form of consumption? TK, we were talking about retail therapy on this show <clears throat> recently when Nicodemus was here in the studio. And quite often, it's like the worst kind of therapy because it 
Mm-hmm. Apes the form of therapy. It makes me feel like I get a little bit of relief. I'm venting. I'm I'm blowing off steam. I'm spending hundreds or thousands of dollars, and I was just browsing. But now I saw the thing that I couldn't possibly live without. We were talking earlier with Alex and Dr. Bush about the pernicious aspects of marketing. And what happens is when we're marketed to really well, we think that we can heal ourselves through retail therapy. Mm. You have something pithy for us. Yeah, you can't consume your way out of misery, but you can create your way into joy. You know, there are some processes in life that are valuable precisely because of some reward you get at the end of them. But there are other processes that are valuable because of who you get to become by virtue of your participation in them. And creativity is such a process. You know, if you make art, if you if you make music, you make literature, whatever it is, even if it isn't very good, there's something about your participation in the creative process that humanizes you, that puts you in touch with yourself and others in a way that is intrinsically healing. And so the culture tells us, hey, feel empty on the inside. Buy your way out of it by getting this product that will fill that hole. And what it really does is it gives us temporary relief while reinforcing the notion that happiness is always out there in something else. But when we create, when we respond to that with that, with activities that place a demand on our sense of wonder, our sense of imagination, our sense of improvisation, our sense of agency, then that puts us in a place where we begin to see that that emptiness is not as deep as we once thought it was. And even if there is some emptiness there, we're able to engage it in a way that imbues it with meaning. You are talking about producing something. And quite often, I don't think we realize, because it seems like a selfish pursuit quite often, when, I'm, when I am creating something, when I have a hobby or a passion and I'm creating rather than consuming, we don't realize that we're often being really generous. I'm so thankful for the people who created the things that I really enjoy. If I think about my favorite novelists like Jonathan Franzen or the memoirist Mary Carr or David Foster Wallace, it might have been a selfish pursuit when they were doing it initially, but they didn't realize there was a ton of generosity there. And so before you and I started recording, we were talking about what minimal maxims do we want to have for the lightning round? Another one you threw out there is the opposite of retail therapy is fearless generosity. And I think what you're touching on there is I can set aside the shopping mall. Nothing wrong with going to the mall if I need to buy something. I mean, it feels wrong to me and it I don't like going there, but it doesn't mean that it's morally wrong. It just means it's kind of gross to me. I don't like, I don't enjoy the experience. But the opposite of that retail therapy is how can I give beyond myself? How can I contribute to one other person or to a community? How can I, how can I give rather than how can I take? How can I get. And I think that's really important, especially this time of year. We're often talking about the holiday shopping season. I'm going to talk to you about that in a moment, but I've got something pithy for sighing bird here. Consumption is not the problem. Consumerism is the problem. Consumerism is the ideology that buying things is going to make you complete. There are many forms of consumerism. Retail therapy can also become experience consumerism. It can become relationship consumerism. Give me, give me, give me. Take, take, take. And we don't stop to pause and say, what can I give to this relationship? Mm. What can I give to this experience? Do I need to consume more? Or maybe I'm already complete and I can share that completeness with others by being generous. All right, let's answer another question here in a moment. But first, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of The Minimalist. Danny Unknown, our talented filmmaker here at The Minimalist, he made this five-part series. They're called Simple Recipes. We're sharing one every week from Black Friday through the end of the year, every Thursday on The Minimalist's Instagram. And these simple recipes, they're not what you think. It's not like how to bake a cake or a pie or a turkey with stuffing. Simple recipe how to, on how to live a, a more meaningful life, what it means to live a meaningful life, especially during the holidays. This is where we really get caught up in everyone else's expectations. And the most recent one that just came out is called A Simple Recipe for Gift Giving. 
So you think about minimalist gift giving. Some people think, ah, they must just be like, Scrooge, bah humbug. I don't celebrate the holidays. Or maybe there's a better way to give gifts in an intentional way. And that's what we do in that video series. You can check it out, instagram.com slash the minimalist. Speaking of gifts, we are opening up our Simplify Everything course again on January 1st. That is next month, but you can gift it to a loved one for Christmas if you'd like. Simplifyeverything.xyz. Here's the good news. It's eco-friendly. (laughs) <laughs> and gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Nicodemus is in it. <laughs> well, that means it's not sugar free. <laughs> <laughs> Natural sweetener. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right. But what's fascinating about this course is we launched it one time last year. It's a five week course, although you can take it at whatever, however long you want to take it. We dole it out over the course of five weeks. Some people take eight weeks to take it. Whatever your schedule is, that's fine. But there are several hundred people who take it with you at the same time. And so you have this whole community of people doing it online. And we simplify five different areas. We start with your stuff. What a great time, brand new year to start simplifying your stuff. But then we look beyond that. We look at your calendar clutter. We look at your relationship clutter. We look at your financial clutter and several other areas. And we look at ways to simplify. Go over there to simplify everything.xyz and just take a look at the testimonials from the students who took the course the first time. Now, we opened up only for 72 hours starting on January 1st, but you can pre-order it now if you'd like to gift it for, to someone for the holidays. All right, fams, Alabama, do we have any questions from our most recent Patreon Zoom call? We call them fams, the Friday afternoon minimalist Zoom, the first Friday of every month. We meet with our Patreon subscribers. We get on a Zoom call. Many of them turn their cameras on and we interact with y'all. Or you can just turn your camera off. You can be a fly on the wall and you can participate with the chat as well. Whole different community going on in the Zoom chat, which is where Malabama is and she's collecting your questions. Take it away, Malabama. Here's one from Amber. I'm trying to maintain my home while in the season of healing, but I'm failing. Any advice? I think we're always in a season of healing, right? Sometimes it feels more pronounced. We don't always realize like our body's constantly healing. If I stub a toe or I have a cut, I'm healing. That's one type of literal healing. But the healing that Amber is talking about here is a more metaphorical healing. Mm. And I don't know what that type of healing is for you, Amber, but healing is part of the letting go process. Or actually, it's the opposite of that. Letting go is part of the healing process. And so sometimes if we aren't healing, it's because we aren't willing or able to let go. Or the story we're telling ourselves is I'm not able to let go Mm -hmm. of something that is preventing me from healing. If I get a cut on my arm and I'm constantly rubbing it because I need to self-soothe and I can't let go of my self-soothing, it's actually harmful to me. And so Part of the healing process is developing a willingness to let go, not prescriptively, but understanding that I'm holding on to a bunch of things that are preventing me from healing. And so the question here is not an answer. It's a question. What is preventing you from healing? What is preventing you from moving on? What are you holding on to that you're telling yourself you can't let go of? It is not allowing you to move forward with that healing journey. Mm. You know, one of the things I, I cherish and I'm grateful for with respect to my hospital experience is when you're on a hospital bed and you've got tubes in your body and you can't even get up to use the bathroom without a, another person helping you out and moving a bunch of stuff around and taking 10 minutes to prepare to pee. You realize that a lot of the stories you tell yourself in your day-to-day life about what absolutely must get done are simply not true because you're now in a position where you simply can't do them and somehow the world is going to go on and make it. Wow. There were certain things I didn't do when I was in that position that I would have never given myself the permission to do if I had the ability to move around. And so that gave me the the gift of being able to see that discrepancy between the stories I tell myself about what must be done and what the reality is when your body says, I'm not letting you do anything. And so one thing I'd say here is first, I'm grateful for the fact that the nature of your healing is such that you're able to move around 
while you do it. That the nature of your healing is such that you're even able to worry about cleaning your home or taking care of your home while you are healing. And what I would say is prioritize the healing and let the home be secondary because the wellness of the home is an extension of the wellness of your soul and how orderly the home is, how well taken care of the home is. It's, it also includes your own energy. It also includes your own presence and your own availability to those with whom you share this home and all of those other things. So take care of you and let this be an opportunity for you to negotiate how much actually has to be done. And just because you you aren't in a hospital bed doesn't mean you have the ability to do something. It might mean you have a greater illusion of being capable to do something. But sometimes when our soul gives us that message of pain and misery, it's saying, hey, just like your body, you're pushing me to do something that I'm not ready and able to do healthfully at this time. You're making me think of something. I was having a conversation with Kristen from Minima, former podcast yeah. guest, a good friend of ours. Minima Online. She is a home organizer. I call them, I, I call her a home minimizer. Mm. And one of her clients had this beautiful revelation just this week as she was helping them through all their stuff. And she showed me this picture of their driveway, parking lot. I don't know what it was, but it was full of stuff. And you know why it was full of stuff? Because he finally realized, he said, if I have a problem where I can't ever stay organized, which is, I think the essence of what Amber's saying here is I'm failing. And what he was saying is I'm failing. I'm failing to stay organized. The problem isn't that I need to organize more. The problem is that I have too much. Now that could be too many commitments. It could certainly be too much stuff. And the way that we organize then is not to buy more bins, more stuff. Oh, but I bought the eco-friendly bins. Well, maybe you don't need those eco-friendly bins. Maybe you don't need the more products to help you organize if you've simplified to the point where you don't have a bunch of excess that's getting in the way. If you're not overwhelmed by the stuff, it's so much easier to stay organized. Yes, it still requires some intention, but most of that intention is around, let me pause before bringing anything new into the space to reclutter it in the not too distant future. But by the way, this is something that you talk about a lot and it makes me so angry sometimes. You have done a really good job at eliminating and minimizing clutter calendar for, from your life. And I haven't. That's one story I'm telling myself that I know is untrue, but I'm so wedded to it. I can't see where the string is I can pull to make that story come apart. It feels real. I'm awake in the dream knowing that this is a dream, but somehow searching for the exit door still. And when you or other people are like, TK, you got to slow down. You can't just do everything. I often feel like, oh yeah, it's so easy for you to say that, but who's going to do X, Y, and Z? Are you going to do X, Y, and Z for me? Well, if you aren't going to do it for me, get out of my face telling me that I need to do less. And that feels so hard, right? But sometimes we got to step back and we got to say, okay, well, what would you do if your body broke down and said, because you never said no and you never dealt with that calendar clutter, I'm quitting on you. And now someone else has got to do it. Or now you got to start asking for help. Or now you got to use your creativity and intelligence in a different way to answer those questions. You can't rely on habitual busyness or do it all myselfness anymore. What are you going to do then? And I've seen my father go through his whole life having people tell him that all the time and him being like, who's going to do it? And now he's in a position where he has to rely on some method other than being able to get up and get after it and work all day. He has to. And I'm looking at him as the prophecy of what I will become if I don't deal with these stories. And that's something that I'm navigating right now. And so I say that not so anybody can feel sorry for me, but when we talk about these things, some of these things are deeply personal, things that we've wrestled with, things that we continue to wrestle with. And I just want to share that empathy, share that opportunity to connect and say, I'm still figuring this out too. This is hard. And when people tell you, you got to let go of a story that it feels like is real, it can feel angrifying and insulting and condescending and feel like there's a lack of empathy. But no, sometimes it's just 
As the saying goes, it's a truth that can set you free, but first it's going to piss you off. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's going to have its way with you first. Yeah. And in fact, those are the best truths, right? I remember when I first stumbled across the work of Kapil Gupta, you were at my house recently and you pulled one of his books off the shelf and you were mesmerized by the direct truth, the willingness to be blunt without the need for anyone to accept it and appreciate it and love it and forward it on or whatever. It was simply the truth. And whether you get something from it or not, and the truth that you're laying on the table right now, TK, which I think is really powerful, not just for Amber, but for the whole discussion we've had today, is everything's negotiable. Once you realize that, oh, if life were to change considerably from right now, I wouldn't be able to do all the things that I dread doing anyway. If there are a bunch of things in front of you that you dread doing, then why do you keep doing them? And that's a genuine question. That is not a rhetorical gotcha question. For some people, it's like, well, I have to pay the bills. Oh, great. Let's, let's look at those bills for a second then. If that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, let's look at those bills. Or if it's because that's the way we've always done it, as we talked to doc, Dr. Bush about. Well, okay. Why have we always done it this way? What is the why behind this assumption or this story that I'm telling myself that I can't opt out. Mm. It is possible to opt out of anything because everything is negotiable. Alabama, we got a beautiful added value segment coming up, a hilarious and beautiful added value segment coming up on the private podcast. But first, what do you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hi, y'all. My name is Tyler, and I'm a Patreon subscriber from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I just had a minimalist tip for anyone that has a decent local library system. I personally use my library for all sorts of stuff besides books. My favorite thing to use it for or to check out are uh, art prints. They have art prints of all different sizes and maybe like a thousand or more um, different art pieces that we could get and um, put in our home. It's, I believe, a four-week checkout, so we have at least a month, and you can often renew them easily. Um, But yeah, it helps us freshen up our our interior, um, especially if we don't want to, you know, hold on to one piece of art for forever. Um, Let's just kind of change things, change our look, but also get pieces of art that match our look and our desire. Um, our library also has like tools, board games, all sorts of cool stuff. So check out the local library for, for anything in life. Thanks. Bye. Wow. All right, y'all. We'll see you on Patreon for the full two and a half hour maximal edition of this episode. I got to tell you, Alex and Dr. Bush, we went deep. We talked about so many different things on the private podcast. There's too many things to actually name. So just head on over to patreon.com slash the minimalist. You'll get a personal link. And by the way, they're doing free trials right now, seven days for free. If you want to check out, you got to check out this maximal episode. We covered so much ground. Patreon.com slash The Minimalist. You also get access to all of our archives all the way back to episode 001, our monthly Zoom calls, home tours, so much more of less. If you leave here today with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Peace. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.